All right, in the interest of time, maybe we can start. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Nancy Kelly Lecture. Uh, this year's talk is uh, sponsored by EHPS, um, uh, Human Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Center for Faculty Research. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to introduce uh, Dr. Lee Badgett today. Uh, we were looking forward to hosting her last year, actually, in person, before pandemic, you know, appended our lives. She was <laughs> kind enough to accept my invitation this year to deliver the lecture uh, remotely, and uh, we are delighted to have her here. Um, uh, Dr. Badgett is an accomplished scholar. She's a professor of economics at the UMass Amherst and Williams Distinguished Scholar at UCLA's Williams Institute. Um, she's one of the pioneers of research in economic inequality for LGBT people, including wage gaps, employment discrimination, and poverty, and on the global cost of homophobia and uh, transphobia. Her fifth book, entitled The Economic Case for LGBT Equality, Why Fair and Equal Treatment Benefits Us All, got published last year. She's also the author of The Public Professor, How to Use Your Research to Change the World. Um, Professor Badgett testified as an expert witness before the US Congress and in litigation. She also has been a consultant to development agencies and uh, businesses. She has a PhD in economics from UC Berkeley. Um, I could keep going, but I'd better stop. Uh, the, the format is um, um, uh, Professor Badgett is going to give her a talk for 30, 40 ish minutes, and then there will be um, 20 minutes or so for your questions and comments. I'll try to moderate based on you know people raising their hands either through uh, Google Meet or physically. So, um, I'm going to leave the stage for uh, Dr. Badgett for her talk now. And all right, great. Well, thank you so much. It's a it's an honor to be uh, invited to give the uh, uh, this memorial lecture for Nancy Kelly. I uh, appreciate the opportunity and the good. The good thing about waiting a year is that the book uh, is actually out that I'm going to talk about. And let me just make sure I can pull up my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, oops, wrong thing. Hmm, hmm. it worked a minute ago. Uh, let's see, what happens if I do this? Does it have to do with? It's not, it's showing me some very, uh, Okay, I think I messed some things up earlier. I apologize. No, no, it's fine. Okay, let me try this. Let me try it now. This might sure, take your time. It's only three. Yep, okay, we've got it. Okay, okay. perfect. I, it was something quirky. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna uh, talk about the, the title that, um, that Asuke mentioned, uh, thinking about the economic case for LGBT equality. And this is a, I would put it in the classification of, of a new idea that uh, that I've been talking about and trying to convince people of. Um, and I'm going to try to pair it with uh, with some thoughts on how we can actually take new ideas or new research and use it out in the world to to hopefully create some kind of change to make the world a more just place, uh, a safer place, a healthier place for us all. So, uh, so I'm going to start with. Um, just uh, telling you about why I am taking uh, on these two tasks. So the first thing is um, that I suspect that if I were to ask you um, uh, whether or not you are someone who believes that LGBT people should be treated equally, that they should be fully included in society, I suspect that many of you would agree with that. Um, if I knew how to use this platform better, maybe I would do a little poll. Um, and probably if I said, well, why do you think that? Uh, you would say something like, it's the right thing to do, or I believe in human rights, that that's, uh, those are the principles that I apply to, to questions about how people in particular groups ought to be treated. 
And in fact, this is the predominant way that we think about LGBT rights all over the world, that uh, that human rights are uh, for everyone, uh, including LGBT people. We have lots of global treaties and um, and agencies and organizations to try to uh, to expand these rights and to uh, and to actually enact them for people. And the main thing that we're thinking about is that LGBT inclusion and equality, the recognition of their human rights, our human rights, uh, is good for LGBT people. That is something that will benefit them. It will make their lives better in some ways. And that is a very important thing to do because uh, we know that in many parts of the world, lives are not so great for LGBT people. Now I'm gonna show you something. There's no way you can read all of these little things. And really, I just wanna get you to kind of just look back at the pattern here. Um, this, these are survey questions, answers to a survey question done by the Pew Research Global Attitudes Project last year that asked people in many different countries, should society accept homosexuality? And if you just kind of squint, you, you can uh, see that, um, that there are many countries kind of in the uh, top two categories in North America and in Europe, many who say yes. So on the, the green bars that stick out to the right, that's the percentage of people who say, yes, society should accept homosexuality. And the blue bars that go off to the left are uh, the percentage of people who say, no, we should not accept homosexuality. So you can see there's a very wide degree of variation, lots of support for the idea in Canada and the US, for example, uh, even more support in Europe. The US is not you know, really at the top of the, uh, the top of the ladder when it comes to um, acceptance, but we do pretty well at 72%. But there are many, many countries where there's you know much less agreement, and in some cases the agreement goes the other way. Uh, so in Indonesia, 80% of people say no. In Nigeria, 91% of people say no, should not be accepted. In Russia, 74% uh, say no. So there are many, many places where these rights, where acceptance of, of LGBT people is not something that we can take for granted. And we have lots of other evidence that shows uh, uh, the problems that they face. And I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Um, but all this is to say is that really, when I look at this, I see room for improvement pretty much everywhere. Sweden and the Netherlands, they're pretty close to 100%. But everywhere there are some people who, uh, who believe uh, that homosexuality should not be accepted or that LGBT people in some form are, are, uh, are less worthy of rights. So we've primarily used a human rights argument to try to go into uh, countries like this or the, the groups that exist there in those countries to argue um, that LGBT people should have human rights. I've talked to many people from some of these countries where the blue bars are much bigger than the green bars. And it's interesting because what they tell me is that they use the human rights argument, but they actually need other ideas that they can use, other arguments that they can use to further the uh, winning of rights for LGBT people. And so that is why actually uh, I wrote uh, this book, The Economic Case for LGBT Equality. Now, um, uh, because I know that it's not so easy actually to, uh, to know what to do with research or a, a new book project um, to get it out there in the world. I wanna also combine this with a discussion of my other book that I was gonna mention, The Public Professor, because there I'm trying to um, give people ideas, give scholars, actually students, uh, faculty alike, ideas for how we can use research in the world. And, and I'll just summarize it for you really uh, briefly, um, that there are three things that I have learned that really effective public professors use, the people who actually have clearly changed the way we look about certain kinds of issues. First thing is they can see the big picture of a debate. So they know where their research and ideas can fit in and make a difference. And you have to know who makes the decisions about things that you care about. You need to know how and when do those decision makers uh, take in evidence or use evidence and ideas to help form those decisions that they have to make. 
The second thing that people do who are very effective at this is they have a very broad network that goes well outside academia um, and might include those decision makers or at the very least people who are important influencers of those decision makers. And there's lots of other kinds of categories, but the, the one that is near and dear to my heart um, on LGBT issues is thinking about the advocates and the community itself of LGBT people around the world who uh, who are uh, looking for ideas. And I uh, uh, am going to talk about kind of how I have uh, partly uh, found those people uh, to uh, to connect with on, on this other project. And then the last thing that uh, public professors are really good at is communicating with lots of different kinds of audiences. By the way, uh, I'm practicing all that I preach here, uh, and you are one of my audiences, so I'm really glad to, to have the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you about this. So I'm going to talk about this book in a way that I kind of call the director's cut. You know, sort of, I'm going to talk about this idea, but also show you how I have uh, use some of these practices of public professors to get it out there in the world. And I will, and, and as I said in the story just a minute ago to kind of set all this up, I am do I wrote this book because of the connections that I had with activists who wanted a tool like this to be able to make an economic case for LGBT equality. So um, so we'll um, dive into that at this point. So what would an economic perspective look like? Well, before I said, you know, LGBT inclusion and, and equality is good for LGBT people, but I'm going to look at a different, uh, a different uh, endpoint, which is that LGBT inclusion and equality is good for the economies of different countries. And because it's good for the economies, that's why I make the argument that it's actually good for everybody. So what does that look like exactly? Well, I'm going to mainly talk about um, what economists call human capital, uh, which really is a way of thinking about the economic potential of people in an economy. Now, human capital is kind of a jarring term for people who are not economists. So let me just say why we call it that for a second. Um, human capital we think of as being like you know, like a house or a car or an oven, things that we buy or things that we have that don't get used up. Uh, when we deploy them. So when we use our educations or the skills and the knowledge that we have acquired in uh, universities and, uh, and school, uh, we don't lose that. We don't, we don't lose anything or give anything up when we use that. It's uh, still there for us to draw on tomorrow when we would do our job again. Uh, so that's why we call it human capital. And it's my argument that this human capital, uh, like a lot of economists think of it, is the heart of an economy and the heart of the success of an economy. This argument, by the way, has been made in the context of gender equality. It's been made in the context of race and ethnic equality as well. And I'm going to apply it to thinking about LGBT equality. What it looks like more concretely, uh, slightly more concretely, um, are things like uh, what happens in the realm of education, what happens in employment, uh, what happens in the health of individual LGBT people. And it's also going to involve thinking about what happens when uh, LGBT people uh, with their education, uh, skills and health uh, go to work for businesses. Um, so these are all part of the connection between inclusion and equality and economic output. And let me just say, I chose these uh, because these are very important sectors, but I also chose these four different sectors because they are very important audiences for thinking about this idea for, um, for equality. And they're not always places that think about equality in terms of human rights. So they, I'm hoping that this will help make an economic case that those uh, people in those sectors will find um, persuasive. So let's start with education. Um, uh, this uh, young man uh, in, in the photo here is named Pema Dorji. He lives in Bhutan. And uh, he is part of, he and I are part of a network of LGBT um, activists and people with those interests. Um, and that's how I learned of his story growing up in Bhutan and going to school. The way he described his experience was it was like going to war. He was uh, bullied and humiliated, not just by his fellow students, but also by teachers. He learned, like so many LGBT students learn all over the world, is that he will be a target. Um, 
and uh, and that is uh, that is a big problem. Uh, that is those are not only human rights violations, but those are um, those are actions that will harm the ability of LGBT young people to gain the skills and knowledge, the educational quality uh, that they uh, that they want and need to go on uh, to be uh, adults. Um, so this happens because bullying. Uh, Bullying can, uh, we know from a lot of research that bullying happens all over the world against LGBT people. And we know that it tends to lower the grades of LGBT people. It tends to make them more likely to miss school. They're more likely to drop out. They're less likely to proceed on to higher levels of education. So these are all ways that uh, the progress of LGBT young people is held back. Interestingly, uh, there's a fair amount of research that shows that bullying doesn't just hurt the LGBT students or the other students who are bullied, but actually can have harmful impacts on outcomes, educational outcomes for everyone in a school. It lowers the quality and quantity of education for everyone but particularly for LGBT young people. And that means that they are, uh, they are leaving school with a, a, a lower amount of that kind of human capital, lower amount of skills, knowledge, creativity that they would be able to, um, to use once they go out into the work world. So let's talk about employment for a second. So when people leave school and go into uh, to work for uh, for companies or start their own businesses, um, we see uh, we see um, a similar kind of of exclusion of LGBT people from being fully accepted and and used in the workplace. Um, this looks like uh, basically discrimination. So the differential treatment of LGBT people is what I'm talking about here. We know this happens again all over the world as well as right here in the US, because people tell us that when we ask them, when we ask them on surveys, they say, yes, I have experienced discrimination. We know it because sometimes, because we see in studies that uh, gay and bisexual men have lower wages than similarly qualified heterosexual men. We see it because scholars have done experiments sending out resumes, one of which is coded for being an LGBT person using a you know, participation in an organization or, or having a name change and comparing it to what happens when you have pretty much identical an identical resume without that kind of signal of being LGBT. And what happens is very clear in almost every study that's been done like this, the people who are LGBT are much less likely to be invited for a job interview. Some of these studies go on to look at job offers and also find lower rates there. So it's another, uh, we have just reams of evidence uh, that uh, LGBT people are treated very differently in the labor market in ways that hurt them very clearly with lower wages, fewer jobs, and, uh, and perhaps greater levels of harassment on the workplace. But I'm going to argue that that also has an effect on their employers in a couple of different ways. One is that uh, it encourages people to, to stay closeted, to stay hidden and not to be fully themselves. And that is actually something that um, we have very good reason to think will lower people's productivity. It takes a lot of cognitive effort to hide who you are, um, to not talk about what you did last weekend or not talk about your family or your same-sex partner or your children. Um, it, takes, uh, it takes a lot out of people in ways that will uh, give them less energy to uh, to uh, be f fully who they are in the workplace. Secondly, uh, we think that uh, economists define discrimination basically as people who are similarly qualified being treated differently. Um, that means in effect that they're being steered, LGBT people are being steered out of jobs where they could be actually more productive. They're gonna be underemployed either because there are outright walls, keeping them out of certain kinds of jobs, which we are just now getting rid of in the military for transgender people, for example, or uh, there are uh, discriminatory kind of funnels that lead people into jobs that fit stereotypes about uh, what LGBT people are supposed to be like. So whenever any of these things happen, people are not able to use that skill, knowledge, creativity fully uh, in ways that will, um, will make them the most productive. So that hurts not just the LGBT person, but also their employer. The third thing I wanna talk about is health. 
that kind of treatment that I was just talking about, whether it's in education or whether it is in uh, uh, employment, that kind of discrimination, bullying, harassment, um, we call these very extreme versions of, of, um, of minority stress. Everybody experiences stress in their lives. Uh, COVID epidemic is probably our, our uh, universal example, but, you know, tra traffic at school, uh, a boss who's annoyed with you, uh, your kids who need something from you, uh, everyday levels of stress are there for us all. But if you're in a stigmatized minority group, you've got extra stressors that you have to contend with, which might be those things like bullying and harassment, which might be the, uh, uh, effort to conceal your sexual orientation or gender identity from other people that you work with. Um, and those kinds of uh, examples of minority stress have been shown uh, to create health disparities between LGBT people and everyone else. So we have, again, decades of research from many different countries that show that these disparities are real and they're very harmful. Um, LGBT people are more likely to experience depression, to experience anxiety, to uh, be uh, substance users, to, uh, to think about or attempt suicide, to uh, having higher rates of HIV, experiencing more violence. All these many different kinds of, um, of health challenges are things that are much more uh, prevalent in the lives of LGBT people than they are for heterosexual people. So, uh, so these things all kind of fit together uh, uh, where employment and uh, educational uh, experiences can create this sort of stress that creates health problems. And you can think very easily about them feeding right back, making it harder to keep a job or to be as productive on the job because health is um, another kind of human capital that, uh, that, that people have and bring, uh, bring with them uh, into the workplace. There is a little bit of good news uh, related to, uh, to thinking about um, health disparities uh, because there's been a lot of research done on this. Um, and some of that research does show that places that have, uh, places like countries or states here in the US that have more inclusive policies actually have fewer health disparities uh, for LGBT people or those differences, those gaps are smaller. Uh, and in some cases, in some countries have completely uh, disappeared as in Sweden. Um, so it, it's, it's an important reminder. It's not just evidence that it's the, uh, the treatment that's making people sick, but it reminds us that we can actually do something about that. So uh, that's something very important to, to kind of keep in mind as we um, continue through this, uh, this idea. So we've looked at what happens to LGBT people as individuals kind of on the ground in their everyday lives. Um, and uh, there, there's another kind of important uh, group that I wanna spend a couple minutes talking about at least, which are, which are businesses. Actually, businesses were amongst the first um, entities, shall we say, institutions that recognized that there could be a kind of economic case for LGBT equality. They think about it as what they call the business case. Um, and the business case, in a lot of ways, is very simple. There are uh, many, many uh, companies across the United States who've who have voluntarily adopted very inclusive policies for LGBT people because they say it makes their businesses stronger. This quote is from those businesses in one of the marriage equality front of the court briefs that businesses all signed together. They said uh, discriminatory laws like not letting people marry uh, can impede business efforts to recruit, hire, and retain the best workers in an environment that enables them to perform at their best. This has given businesses a reason to, to be very vocal advocates in many different countries about, uh, about the need for less discrimination against LGBT people and marriage equality in particular. Um, and uh, the research backs them up. It shows that when LGBT people um, report that their workplaces are more supportive of them, more inclusive of them, that they their experiences 
are uh, better for them and better for their employers. They have greater job commitment. Uh, these these bars in this particular graph uh, uh, on the right, the blue bars are showing you about how many different studies, individual studies um, have shown these effects. So 16 studies have found greater job commitment. Uh, 14 studies have found improved health outcomes. 11%, 11 studies have found increased job satisfaction. Their studies showing more openness, better workplace relationships, less discrimination, a uh, little bit on increased productivity. So these are all things that LGBT people themselves are reporting. When they are in workplaces that are more supportive of them, they are, uh, they are better off in ways that also make their employers better off because greater job commitment, job satisfaction means people are less likely to leave and go work for someone else. There's now also a, a growing body of research looking at financial outcomes. And they show again that businesses that are more inclusive do better. Uh, they have higher stock prices, they have higher profit levels, they have higher productivity, and they can attract a more creative workforce. My own kind of, uh, I don't know, this is my favorite. This is like, to me, one of the most vivid examples of this um, importance for businesses comes from the fact that um, the businesses have taken action in states where uh, in states in the U.S. that have passed uh, restrictive or discriminatory laws. So I'm actually from North Carolina. Unfortunately, it was my own home state that uh, was the first to pass a bathroom bill uh, in uh, 2017 that actually required employers in that state and required every entity in that state to discriminate against transgender people, limiting their access, their ability to choose the bathroom that best fit their own, their gender identity, uh, making that choice for themselves. Um, many companies said that's discriminatory. We don't want to move uh, and uh, locate our new facility in your state. That's what PayPal said. Other events like the NBA All-Star Game, the NCAA basketball tournament said, we don't want to hold our big events in a state that's discriminatory. Uh, so they moved them elsewhere. Uh, when somebody added up, uh, the Associated Press added up the losses from all of these business actions, at the end of the day, it almost reached $4 billion. Uh, that's a big hit for the economy of North Carolina. And it's kind of interesting to think about in another way. Uh, it was designed as a bill to hurt uh, transgender people of whom there certainly are many in North Carolina, but probably the loss from the businesses who decided not to, to locate or do business in North Carolina um, actually probably had a much bigger impact on many non-LGBT people who would not have access to the benefits of that, that spending. They would not get the jobs uh, that would have been created but were not because of that, that bathroom bill. So, so sometimes it's possible to actually see very clearly how treating LGBT people uh, in, in a, in a, um, and depriving them of human rights actually hurts everyone. And that's a great example of it. So, so that's kind of the individual story for LGBT people. Um, that's, I think, very individually oriented. You can think about it from the perspective of businesses. Let me just say a couple words about what this looks like when you add it up to the country level. Um, uh, one way to think about whether or not um, uh, LGBT rights, uh, LGBT uh, ex inclusion, full inclusion and equality, whether or not it is helpful to countries and their um, and their economic uh, development, their growth of their economies over time, is to uh, to look at a correlation between measures of rights and access and acceptability, acceptance, acceptance of LGBT people, and look to see if countries that are higher on that kind of acceptance are actually doing better economically, measured as uh, um, gross domestic product. That's, that's where we just add up everything that gets produced in an economy. And this graph that I'm showing you here um, just looks on the bottom. At the, it was a very simple legal measure that we used in the first study that I did with some colleagues where we just counted up so the number of laws that uh, granted some kind of legal recognition to LGB people. I'll show you the transgender rights in a second. And then we plotted it against uh, GDP per capita um, on, the, on that vertical axis. And you can see that, you know, there's a very clear kind of upward trend there. 
countries that have more uh, more rights for LGBT people actually have higher levels of GDP per capita, per, per GDP per person. Same kind of correlation for transgender rights using a different kind of uh, measure. Um, we have, uh, I've conducted other studies that look at uh, different kinds of measures, including public opinion about LGBT people and different kinds of legal rights. And they all show that even after you control for all the other kinds of things that matter for economies, um, that still economies that are better, they're more accepting and treat LGBT people more inclusively are doing better economically. Um, and it's, it's not a trivial number. Um, uh, in the most recent study that I did, uh, we found that one additional right was associated with about $1,000 more in GDP per capita. So that's a, that's a much bigger pie in the countries that, uh, that we're talking about. And that means that when you divide that up, uh, it's more likely uh, that everyone is going to be able to share in the, the benefits of, of growth. Um, there are many caveats to this kind of interpretation, which I'm happy to talk about later if you're, if you're interested. And then the last thing I'll just point out is that the other way to look at this is to take each one of those individual disparities, the, um, uh, the difference in treatment in the workplace and the health disparities in particular. We have some pretty good measures of those in several different countries and try to estimate a financial cost to that loss of productivity, to that, uh, to those higher levels of health, of health, uh, and mental health and physical health uh, conditions that, that hold people back. And when we've done that uh, in several different countries, I've done it in India and the Philippines, other people I know have done it for Kenya and South Africa. Basically, we end up looking at about a 1% loss of GDP. Um, and, uh, when economists look at lost GDP, we, we have a word for that. It's called a recession. You know, we're experiencing a much worse recession right now, obviously. Uh, but but uh, in the normal ups and downs of economies, uh, business cycles, 1% uh, loss of GDP would be considered a recession. Even though, so even though it doesn't sound like a very large number, we can, we put that kind of name on it. But just to give you another sense of the scale of that, if we thought about the whole world's economy and thought about what 1% of the whole world's economy would look like, it would be basically the economy of Turkey. It would be the economy of the Netherlands. So 1% sounds small, but it's really not when you, uh, when you put it into that perspective. So that's the, that's the, you know, kind of some of the basic idea about, um, about why uh, there's an economic cost as well as a human individual cost, a human rights cost to, uh, to not having full equality and inclusion of LGBT people. So let me talk about why I think that matters. Um, why I think having a different way of looking at this question um, can help move us towards more equality to a fuller acceptance of the human rights of LGBT people. Because it goes hand in hand with the, with the human rights argument. Uh, in many ways, I'm just kind of putting a dollar value on the loss of human rights that people do, ver do experience in a very real way. But the real value to this argument is that I think it opens the doors to decision makers that are not normally thinking about human rights. They're not human rights agencies. They're not bound uh, uh, by some kind of human rights uh, mission that they are supposed to be fulfilling. And that would be businesses, right? They're not there uh, to promote human rights. They're uh, there to, uh, to do well for their, uh, their shareholders, but also their employees, uh, of course. Um, it's there for development agencies uh, and for development banks that, again, are not supposed to be political or thinking about human rights. They're supposed to be thinking about, you know, what if we make this investment in this country? Uh, is it going to pay off in some way? Um, and in some cases, uh, I have learned that it actually is a very persuasive argument for policymakers um, who want to know what the economic effects are. Often they're worried about harmful economic effects. So it's very important if you can show that not only are the economic effects of a non-discrimination law, say, 
they're not negative, but they're in fact positive, um, that is something that um, often will give them uh, a great deal more confidence in their, uh, and great more, a great deal more willingness to move forward with the, the better laws. So I think we can use these in ways that will um, help LGBT people's lives uh, by expanding rights, uh, possibly by bringing more resources to LGBT organizations, hopefully by uh, giving us more data so we can track better um, how well LGBT people are doing all over the world. So, um, so I think uh, that's really the, the, the power of this argument, of this idea. Now putting it into play, how do you actually take it out there in the world to do that? Um, coming back to thinking about the public professor, what I have learned is that it's very important to have very broad, expansive networks of decision makers. I could actually even show you a map of, you know, kind of this particular uh, space, uh, policy space, and who's in, who's making these kinds of decisions. Um, and uh, what I have uh, tried to do with the idea, just to give you a very on a very practical level, I've tried to communicate it in lots of different ways to those networks that I have been part of. Um, uh, one way I've communicated it is to write a lot of, uh, just write op-eds about the book and about these issues when they emerge in different kinds of places. That's a good way to uh, to educate the public. I've talked to uh, uh, reporters uh, in different kinds of news media in different parts of the world um, over the years about this particular issue. They um, often are very interested in a kind of a unique take on uh, a new idea about an old issue. And as I said, once the book uh, once the book got published uh, last May, I um, worked very hard to figure out how to communicate it much more directly. And you know, this is where I guess the you know silver lining of the COVID epidemic is that everybody's on Zoom. Uh, suddenly, there were lots of organizations that wanted content for uh, for webinars, uh, and so I was able to take the network that I had built to learn about this problem. Um, and to uh, to think about the kinds of things I needed to be able to say about the economic case for LGBT equality, and those became audiences. So I've talked to many audiences of activists. I've talked to lots of multinational businesses, many LGBT business networks, development banks and agencies, researchers and students. That's you, uh, and uh, members of policymakers in different uh, different countries. In particular, I uh, met with some members of brief members of the UK Parliament. Uh, a few months back. So uh, so I think it is not an easy thing to, um, to, to take a new idea and to give it some legs and get it into the hands of the people who need it. But if we start our projects, um, uh, our academic projects, with that in mind, we can use them to shape how we talk about uh, how we talk about problems, the particular questions that we take on, um, the, uh, um, the, the, the way we write about them for, our, for audiences that are not part of our academic fields, so getting rid of the jargon, and then at the other end, <laughs> resisting the ever-present temptation to say, I finished that book, that project is done, I'm moving on. Because that's really where the power begins when you have, uh, when you have a completed intellectual product that's got some valuable ideas that you can take out there in the world. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's always important to remember that once you get to the end, then that's really where the, the, the power begins. So um, I'll stop there and uh, you know, hopefully we can, um, have a conversation about some of these things. So thank you. Thanks so much, Lee, for this insightful talk. And uh, it definitely makes a compelling case, I think. Um, I want to open the floor for your uh, questions and comments. Um, you could, you can use this raise your hand the functionality of Google Meet, or you can physically raise your hand. <laughs> Or you can use the chat box, maybe. Um, let me see. Oh, I think. Is Jason Smith raised a hand? Oh, okay, e excellent. Uh, Jason, yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Domestia. I was waiting like a good student to be called. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Dr. Badgett, I'm sending you a multi-layered thank you for being here today. This talk is so fascinating and important. And, um, oh, first of all, my name is Jason Smith. I serve as the Assistant Dean for Student Success at SSU. Um, okay. I will definitely be getting a copy of this book. Um, one of the other uh, initiatives that I work on on campus is facilitating our uh, Safe Zone program on campus. And one of the topics that we actually do cover in that training is talking about this very thing, which is that homophobia and transphobia do not only impact LGBTQ individuals. Uh, and the way that we frame this discussion is basically in terms of um, academic equity and really a democratic education, where in which in the classroom and, and beyond, um, everyone's a learner and everyone's a teacher, right? And when we don't have a welcoming environment for all, we're missing on perspectives, right? And thereby we're, we're, we're missing out on the opportunity to learn from everybody in the classroom and thereby everybody hurts, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna follow that statement with two questions. Well, one is which um, many of the, um, more uh, social justice minded students will follow up this discussion by saying, Jason, I can tell that you're trying to make a case or a rationale for equality for LGBTQ people outside of just, it's just what we should be doing. And they wanna know more about why. Why do we need to make this rationale outside of just human rights or it's just the right thing to do? And then my second part of the question to you is, because I have not come up with a great answer to that really great question that students are asking, do you as an educator have some, some insights to share with the students when they do ask, why do we need to come up with other mm -hmm. reasons other than yeah. it's just what they should do? Yeah, that, that's, that's a really great point because it, it, it makes it sound like we have to do more than everybody else does to get the same respect and dignity and, and treatment. Um, I guess I I like to think about it in a couple of different ways. I mean, one is one is very practical from a, the perspective of, um, of of being somebody who wants to change hearts and minds. And um, if you um, you know kind of run into a, a roadblock on on one path, and people can't see their way through that, if they can't see their way through the human rights argument then why uh, why not try something else? Um, and um, and sometimes that will lead people back in, uh, to, the, to the other place. So uh, so um, uh, for the for the economic case for businesses, um, uh, businesses often will uh, will like to make that kind of argument that I that I outlined that it's good for their business. They recruit and retain the best employees um, who then are at their most productive. Um, because uh, because they may have employees or they may have um, shareholders who who are a little nervous about it, you know, much less so now than than used to be. But certainly at one point that was an issue, um, and they can justify it in that way. But a lot of those businesses, you know, because businesses are made up of people, a lot of those people in those businesses making this argument also say, and it's the right thing to do, you know? So it's not an either or, even for businesses, it's not an either or. We can have both of these things at the same time. But I don't know, maybe I've just been hanging out with lawyers too much. Uh, when you read a, a legal brief, it's got, here's this argument. And if you don't like this one, here's another one. And if you don't like that one, here's yet another one, you know? So you just keep throwing things <laughs> at people until you get something that kind of gets their attention. And sometimes that learning, Kind of brings them along on the other side, you know, to to come back and see, yeah, this is just the right thing to do, you know. So, so that's I, I think you can you can see it as just a different path to kind of get back to the to the same place. Um, uh, so that's one reason. And I feel I feel like so there was a second question there that I uh, I was yes I, I was just yeah. wondering if to the direct perspective that in the classroom mm -hmm. everyone is impacted by not providing a welcoming environment. Just your yeah. additional thoughts as, as an educator. Yeah, no, I absolutely think that that's true. I mean, I mean, this is our responsibility as educators is to provide a place where 
uh, you know, where everyone has a chance to participate, but that we are also creating, we're creating knowledge as well as knowledgeable people, right? So, uh, so if we are missing out on perspectives, everybody's, uh, everybody's experience falters. I mean, I, I don't know. I hope I'm not the only person who, who could say this, you know, there have been times where you try to have a discussion in the classroom and it falls a little flat. There's not enough disagreement, right? You know, I, I mean, how could that be on some of these controversial topics? Somebody's holding back, right? And it does mean that people aren't going to have their, their, uh, you know, their, uh, they're not going to be challenged to make the best possible argument. They're not going to be challenged to understand things from somebody else's perspective. So, so yeah, so I absolutely think that, that that's true. Um, and, and I am fairly certain that it happens in lots of different contexts. So I'm an economist. Um, I'm on the, um, the equity, uh, diversity and, uh, Professional Conduct Committee of the American Economic Association. And we did a survey a couple of years ago uh, about people's experience, about the climate. And it, it was it was horrific, really. Uh, that's a, This is a whole other story. But one of the things we asked people was, you know, uh, has your experience as a, as a woman, as a person of color, as an LT, LGBTQ person, has it affected how you participate in seminars, decide to go to seminars, ask questions in seminars? Uh, yes. Many people reported yes. This kind of avoidance behavior, it, it is a real uh, loss to all of us to not have the voices and, and, uh, and eager engagement with ideas that, that we have to have to, to keep us all moving uh, in terms of ideas. Thank you so uh, much. Thanks. Um, so there are two questions on the chat, uh, one of them from one of our students, Andrew. Uh, they say, do you think low levels of LGBT acceptance could be rooted in economic disparities? I noticed a lot of the less accepting countries on the first figure were countries that have been economically sidelined or exploited. Uh, thanks so much for being here too. And I think there's kind of like a follow up. Um, as a quick by uh, Kat, uh, uh, as a quick follow up to Andrew's question, could you explain it to a total non-economist <laughs> what it means to control for economic factors to compare economies? You mentioned yeah. it all, and I know in general what you mean, but I don't know what things specifically you might control for or what it means means. Thanks yeah. for this perfect talk. Yeah, yeah. No, those are two great questions. Uh, definitely. Let's start with the second, the first one, just because it makes the second one a little bit clearer. Um, uh, when we say controlling for, we're using statistical procedures that allow us to kind of compare countries that look the same in certain ways, but just differ on one thing, like they differ on um, the acceptance of LGBT people. The kinds of uh, things that we control for in our equations are the education level and other measures of the larger human capital stock, um, the late size of the labor force in a country, uh, its capital stock kind of measured as, you know, those value of the buildings and other uh, land and other uh, things that we use to, to create goods and services and economies, um, levels of trade, um, and then we had a, some others that were in there off the top of my head. I can't remember exactly what they were, but we're trying to sort of say, let's, let's compare apples to apples, right? So, you know, really not so much comparing low income countries to high income countries overall, but low income countries, uh, with more or less the same levels of those other things and look to see if the ones that are more accepting actually, uh, are doing a little bit better. Um, so that is basically uh, what we did and, and, and what we found. So, con, you know, the ones that seem similar are uh, are doing better. Now, so that I, I actually try to uh, describe this very carefully in the talk uh, as a correlation. And um, and Andrew is quite right to ask, well, maybe is that is that correlation something that might be explaining explained by some other kind of way of thinking about this and yeah it is so uh, uh the first thing you learn in stats is you know correlation is not causation so it is uh possible that um higher income countries develop stronger views on on human rights and st stronger human rights in, in general and uh become more um uh, accepting of LGBT people. And there are political scientists who made this argument. They call it the post-materialist hypothesis. The idea is 
that when countries get a little richer, that they don't have to worry quite so much about just, you know, just barely getting by and, and uh, subsistence levels of, of, of existence. They can start, you know, having, uh, uh, they can start moving away from very strong traditions that may be very authoritarian or rooted in particular religious uh, uh, beliefs um, to, to thinking more about, you know, the, the fact that individuals might might want to have some rights on their own that we can, um, you know, not restrict people to their, these very traditional roles. Um, uh, and it might mean that we um, are more open to, to, to different ideas. If this is going along with levels of education, that's certainly one reason, you know, kind of one path to, to seeing that. Um, richer countries might make it easier for people to form organizations that will advocate for rights. Um, so there's all sorts of, you know, kind of ways that you can connect the dots there um, so but the but the basic end of the day is that it's not that countries that are better for LGBT people get richer it's that richer countries get better rights for LGBT people I suspect both things are happening um, uh, and I think it's uh, it's a self it would be a self-reinforcing cycle it is perhaps I was gonna, you can correct me if I'm wrong maybe the hardest thing in economics <laughs> to sort out which direction the causation goes. Um, so, uh, so that's why I would kind of point back to thinking about it from that, that very individual perspective to kind of motivate a belief that at least some of that, some of that correlation is because LGBT people are able to do more in more accepting environments. They get better educations. They're, they're gonna be better off in the workplace. Their health will be better. All of these things will contribute more to, uh, to economies. And that exercise of building up from those disparities to get to that 1% number is an example of that, that I think kind of argues that at least some of, at least some of that correlation is likely to be causation. So that's that, that's kind of my argument. Now there's another there's another thing that's kind of also there in your um, uh, in in your question that I think is very interesting, and I I've only seen one study that shows this, but um, that post materialist hypothesis that political scientists have explored, um, they there's one study that suggests that actually although you know, higher levels of GDP make for more accepting countries. If you have a lot of inequality, even though you have a high GDP, you might have less acceptance because of the inequality. So two countries, the same GDP, one more equal than the other, it's the more equal one that will actually be doing much better in um, in LGBT acceptance than the, the less equal one, the, mo the more unequal one. So their argument is that there's um, you know, perhaps some, some, you know, resentment, uh, or lack of trust that exists in, in, um, in more unequal countries that holds people back from being accepting. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's a really interesting question that I hope, I hope some of those folks will take on and do more with. Uh, I've seen Ben Lieberman raising their hand and Eric, I think is the next. Yeah. Hello. Thanks for um, coming to Fitchburg State, you know, virtually and giving us, you know, this excellent presentation. Um, my question, actually, may be better addressed to Eric a little bit because he works in the Philippines. But looking at the um, the graphs, the Philippines just seems like it's off the charts in terms of not being comparatively that wealthy, but having comparatively a very high support for LGBTQ people. And just looking at that P report that, that you had in the link, it looks like that's mm -hmm. been the case for some time. So how does your model kind of account for the Philippines, which really does seem like it's like it's not way more accepting of, of rights than some other countries and have higher uh, average incomes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, there's, um, you know, the the correlation is kind of boiling it all down to an average, right? So taking the ones that are high and the ones that are lower. And um, I think the Philippines is a is a really interesting case. I, I've, I've been there and done some speaking in the Philippines and I met with um, a lot of uh, a lot of activists there who've been working in many different sectors. So there's a very vibrant LGBT activist culture there um, that I think makes a big difference. There's there's an openness to their operations. 
Um, when I was there, it was before President Duterte was elected, but he was known for, uh, uh, he was the mayor of a, a big city that I went to and I'm spacing out on the name at the moment, but he was known for being very open, relatively open as, it, as, as politicians in the Philippines go towards LGBT rights. You know, I think not every, not everyone agreed that he was, you know, really great on, on LGBT rights and certainly he has issues in other areas, but, uh, um, so there, there has been kind of a climate of openness. There's been a lot of open discussion in the Congress about LGBT rights issues. Culturally, there are uh, television shows that feature many LGBT characters. Uh, there's an LGBT, uh, excuse me, political party. Now my dog just found something to eat. Uh, excuse me, sorry. I've learned with him I can pay now or pay later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so there's uh, so there was a lot going on. So I suspect that you know that that what you're seeing is you know some activists who very skillfully kind of taken that openness and 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 used it to start changing policies, which uh, or to start changing minds, which at some point seems likely to start changing policies, even though it's been slow going and has been mostly at the local level there. Well, I actually. Uh, I, this is Nellie Wadsworth from the Philippines. I actually oh, agree good. with uh, Professor Budget. I think uh, um, L LGBTQ is um, really an, an acceptable, I mean, an accepted group of people in the Philippines. I mean, culturally, just uh, knowing and being surrounded with uh, gay and lesbian, uh, you know, population in the Philippines in both in my uh, family and neighbors and friends. Um, and it seems like, um, I think, uh, as you mentioned, the government, it, um, you know, I think it's basically, um, there is always uh, part of this conversation about, uh, you know, uh, elevating the rights of LGBTQ, uh, you know, le you know gay and lesbian population. There are some, uh, you know, there are still some uh, kind of uh, culturally, there are still these uh, uh, gay men are more accepted mm. than, uh, you know, than women and gay women. And um, I think it's still the, the old generation think that if you are a gay man, um, that means that you also gonna have to do a lot of this work that is done by women. And if you don't have a woman in the family, it, it's always like the mother that does everything. So if there's a, you know, a, a, a gay man in the family, it seems like <laughs> the, the housework, it seems like it goes to him. And, but that's in more on the, you know, the far flung, the villages and, um, you know, other, not in the cities. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Eric Bad has. Thanks for a really great talk. Uh, it was really interesting, and I've been back and forth to the Philippines a number of times. But I actually didn't want. I wanted to talk about a couple other uh, Asian countries. Um, your talk really got me thinking about Japan and South Korea. And a lot of times when I'm reading articles about the situation of women in the workforce, you know, they'll always make a passing statement that economically doesn't make sense and it's bad economically. Uh, so I'm wondering, has anyone, have there been studies done in Japan or South Korea about making the uh, economic, like you did, but making the economic case for women's rights uh, and women's inclusion in the economy? And then my second question was sort of a follow-up. Have you reached out to members of the um, women's rights community in Japan and South Korea? Because it seems like your work would really dovetail so nicely with it. Yeah, those are yeah great questions and interesting examples. Um, they uh, to mine. I'm trying to think. There there may have been some explicit studies trying to to measure the overall economic impact of uh, kind of uh, women's sort of lack of full inclusion in the workforce. There, uh, it certainly gets talked about a lot um, uh, because the differences are so stark in terms of. Uh, labor force participation and the, um, uh, anyway, 
So, so I guess my answer, unfortunately, is no. I don't know of any specific studies uh, like that. But certainly, uh, the LGBT activists that I know, at least some in, in South Korea and in Japan, they they do work very much with the feminist movement. There, many of them come out of the feminist movements, uh, well, or are still in both movements. <laughs> I guess is a better way to put it. Um, um, and see, you know, some some common cause. Although I think. Um, I think that there's uh, often uh, there's in feminist movements generally sometimes there is less than full embracing of LGBT rights as an issue. That's certainly in the history of the feminist movement in the U.S. That was true. Um, so um, yeah, so I'm afraid I don't know enough to sort of be very specific about that. I have a question, actually. I I think it is great that you're showing that correlation between GDP and the LGBT legislation. But I mean, making an analogy with women's issues, uh, for example, in Turkey, right? Like you can have the legislation, you can have the laws on the books, but they might not get enforced. That is the issues with like, you know, anti uh, like domestic violence, for example, either um, the police officers or the judges, you know, might not enforce the rules. So I'm just like wondering whether it is, there's a way to make a differentiation between like legislation and whether the, the rules get get enforced in the research. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point um, because we know that laws in the books don't always lead to equality and, and it's a struggle. So, but it's a first step um, in the US, we know that, you know, We've had laws for racial and gender equality for a long time. It hasn't really fully happened yet, but you know, but they're but they're a tool that can be used in that way. And I think the few studies in the U.S. where you can look at across states, where some states have better laws than others, suggest that there there is a difference. It's actually not a huge difference, though. It's not a it's not a huge difference. So there's still something more than public policies that we need to do, and I think that we don't have really good answers for yet. Right. Um, I think we're almost out of time and I don't want to tire <laughs> Professor Budget more. Uh, so if there is not any other questions, uh, I'm just going to thank you very much for coming here and being with us uh, today. Uh, thank you. And for giving this presentation. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks to you all. It was an interesting conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.